Welcome back to another episode of the Educational AD Podcast, brought to you by Violet Defense. Violet Defense is dedicated to protecting our world from germs by bringing the power of UV disinfection to everyday spaces. Their patented technology enables them to harness the power of the sun to incorporate ultraviolet light into products and environments like never before. Whether you're ready to implement existing products or if you'd like to explore researching and developing a custom deployment of their technology for your school, Violet Defense has the solutions and the experience you need. Thanks again to Violet Defense for sponsoring the Educational AD Podcast. We also want to thank Sideline Interactive. Sideline Interactive provides indoor scoring tables and video boards that can generate over $10,000 a year while also creating excitement in your gym. Their score tables and video boards also help create the ultimate game day experience by creating lifelong memories for your student athletes. Go to sidelineinteractive.com or call 832-786-0302 to schedule a live web demo and see their tables and boards in action. You can also email them at sales at sidelineinteractive.com and see what their fantastic products can do for you. That's sidelineinteractive.com. The Educational AD Podcast also wants to thank Varsity Brands, including BSN, Varsity Spirit, and Herf Jones. Varsity Brands, elevating student experiences in sport, spirit, and achievement. We also want to thank Hometown Ticketing, helping thousands of schools across the country provide convenient digital ticketing options for their communities, families, and fans. Hometown Ticketing, simple and easy online ticketing. Finally, we want to thank Ephesus Lighting, Camp Mobile, Vital Signs, and Gipper for helping sponsor the Educational AD Podcast. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Educational AD Podcast. We've got a really uh, cool guest today, George Tommen, who is the Executive Director of the Florida High School Athletic uh, Association, our state association here in Florida, is going to be on the show today. George, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Jake. I'm glad to be with you today. Well, uh, for our listeners, we are recording this on August 17th, so it's going to be pretty timely by the time you listen to it. And in Florida, like many states, uh, we are already, um, you know, kind of back in school for many of our programs. So uh, it's going to be exciting to hear what's happening uh, in, in our home state. So, George, we always like to let our listeners have a chance to get to know our guests. So. Tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, where you grew up, where you went to school, you know, your career, and, and maybe how you ended up as the executive director for FHSAA. Certainly, I can do that. And I first start off by telling everybody I'm a local boy. I was born and raised in Florida, and there aren't many my age who were born here, but I was born and raised in, and still live in Ocala, Florida. That's in the central part of, of our state. I attended the public schools in, in Marion County, both my mother and father were public school teachers. My father was a coach and also an official with the FHSAA many, many years ago before his passing. Uh, I played basketball and baseball in high school. I went to Forest High School. Uh, I then went to our local junior college and tried to play a little bit of basketball there. But you know, at some point in time in your career, you got to decide that you're just not quite good enough to go to the next level. After junior college, I went to Valdosta State College up in the southern Georgia and received a degree in history there, met my wife-to-be there, and then I returned to Ocala and began my teaching and coaching career. Uh, my wife and I have been married now, since you mentioned a timely podcast, at just 44 years uh, to each other, as a matter of fact, uh, just last week, and uh, we're excited. We have two children. Uh, both of our girls, uh, they're in their 30s now, but they both played high school sports and one played college volleyball. And so we've been real blessed with them. We now have four grandchildren. 
I began my professional career as a teacher and a coach, a basketball coach, probably not a very good one, but at Lake Weir High School in Candler, Florida, which is in the southeast portion of Marion County. I was there for only three years and then went to Dunallen High School as an assistant principal, a small school in the southwest corner of Marion County. And then I came into town to the big school. I went to Vanguard High School as assistant principal and then went to became principal of an elementary school, Marion Oaks Elementary School for a short time. And then for nine years, I had the opportunity to serve as, as the principal of Forest High School, where I graduated from high school. And uh, that was a pretty neat occasion. Both of my, my girls went to Forest High School. My oldest uh, daughter avoided me like a plague, and I couldn't keep my youngest daughter out of my office. She was always wanting money or gum or something like that. After my tenure at Forest High School, I became an executive director with the district uh, supervising principals, along with another executive director working directly for the superintendent of schools. And then in 2012, I ran for superintendent. We have an elected superintendent in Marion County. I ran for superintendent and was elected in 2012. I ran again for superintendent in 2016 and was not uh, reelected. At that time, I was in my 40th year as an educator, uh, all in Marion County. And I said, well, God has another plan for me. I think it's time that I retire. And uh, about two weeks after the election, I was contacted through a mutual friend uh, that I, and encouraged me to apply for the job as the uh, FHSAA executive director. I uh, was very familiar with that association, of course, having been a high school athlete and knowing officials and referees. My father also, uh, as an assistant principal and a coach, of course, I interacted with many officials and, and sporting events. Uh, I think I attended every Dunellen athletic event and every Vanguard event for the 16 years that I was an assistant principal. And then, of course, uh, I enjoyed my time and was very active with the association when I was a principal at Forest High School. So it was kind of a natural thing for me. I, I made some inquiries. Uh, my wife was thrilled that I was making inquiries. You got me out of the house and uh, I was selected, fortunately for me, and I began this position in May of 2017 and enjoyed every, enjoyed every minute of it since that time. That's a pretty good summary, Jake. I don't know if I can do any better than that. Well, and that was a very good summary as well. Uh, it's always interesting to hear, you know, the various stops along the way and, uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, my hat's off to you. Uh, I, I just, as you know, retired in June uh, after 41 years. And, uh, you know, you're still uh, you know, going strong uh, well after that. So uh, very cool. Uh, George, one of the things that we also ask our guests um, has to do with this area of leadership, particularly mentorship. So I I'm curious, who were some of your mentors that you had uh, growing up, you know, maybe family members or, or teachers or coaches, or maybe people that you worked with. Uh, can you tell us who's had an impact on your life? That, absolutely. The first and foremost, of course, my mother and father, there's no doubt. I had a special relationship with my father and a special relationship with my mother, both of them a little bit different. I was also blessed to have an older brother. My older brother was six years older than me. So I always kind of looked up to him. So when I was in elementary school, he was in high school. When I was in junior high school, he was in college. So I always looked up to him also. Then, of course, I look back to some of my favorite coaches that I had. And, of course, my basketball coach in high school was probably one of my favorite guys. I wanted to grow up to be like him. We were quite successful as a team, not as individuals, but as a team. And I thank John Rogers for, for his influence on my life during that time. And then for the next group of years, I guess you'd say, I, I was able to pick and choose bits and pieces from different people. Uh, just as important to learn how to do things, I certainly paid attention how not to do things. And I think that's a very important thing that led me to be who I am. Uh, certainly there are some people that are instrumental in my church life. Also as a youngster, I had a great Sunday school teacher or two here along the way, but, uh, I always listened a lot. And, and I remember, uh, something, and I'll probably talk more about this later that, that God gave us, uh, two ears and one mouth and, and you should use those things accordingly. And so you should listen twice as much as you talk, although it may not sound like I'm doing that right now. <clears throat> Well, again, we gave you that license to uh, to share. 
Uh, and again, I always find it fascinating to hear the stories about those people that helped us get where we are today. Uh, George, another thing that we do at the podcast is this idea of sharing best practices. And, you know, you certainly uh, seen it from a lot of different perspectives. You know, as you mentioned, you know, growing up, you know, uh, as a student athlete um, and with you know, your parents, uh, the officials, uh, as an assistant principal, as a coach, and now, you know, as an executive director over, you know, the entire state of Florida. Uh, I'm wondering if you could maybe pick out two or three uh, best practices that you've seen at schools. You don't have to name the school unless you really want to. Uh, but, you know, what are some best practices that you can share with our listeners that you've seen over your uh, long and successful career? Certainly, and, and that's easy to do because you, you prepped me for this and when we spoke a couple of months ago and you asked me to be thinking about this. So I think that these suggestions might serve any, any walk in life or any purpose and not just a, in the sports world, not just for an athletic director. But the first thing that, that I, would, I, would, I would say is don't be afraid to ask questions. And uh, my fellow principals and fellow assistant principals as I was coming up absolutely hated it when I raised my hand because I was always full of questions. I would ask a question of the superintendent. I would ask a question of other principals. I would ask questions all the time. And everybody would look at me and look at their watch and say, we're ready to go home. But at the same time, I also know that after the meeting, someone would say, hey, thanks for asking that question. So I never say there's a bad question, just a longer meeting. The, the second thing that, that I would find, and you've always already used this term, and that's, that's a mentor or a mentorship. I think anybody, whether it be an athletic director or an assistant principal or a principal or a husband or a father needs to find a mentor of some sort. And there are two, two phases of that mentorship to me, and it might even become two different mentors. But one would be, and I'm thinking along the lines of an athletic director right now, is find someone who can help you understand the technical aspects, the rules and regulations, the black and white stuff, the boring stuff that, that you, you just need to know. What are eligibility requirements? Uh, what, are, what is required of your student athletes, whatever it might be? And that's what I consider the technical side. And the other thing that I would mention as far as a mentor is concerned, and it very well could be the same person, but it often is a different person. And that's find someone that you can talk about the personal stuff with. My principal won't let me do this. My superintendent won't let me do that. How do you handle a personal situation with a student athlete? How do you handle a personal situation with a teacher that has a teacher student athlete conflict, whatever it might be? So a mentorship can, can be both technical or professional. And I think you also need to have something from, from a personal, personal nature. And then the, the last thing that I, I would always say, and, and we, there's tons of different terms for this, but there's the concept of pay it forward. There's the concept of, of supporting others. And our job as an association and a, a job of athletic directors is to support your student athletes, to support your coaches and staff, to support your parents and community. And I see those as the three big things that you need to support. And if you do support those, you will reap benefits from that. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that uh, that little bit of, if you call it paying forward, that's fine, but it's gonna come back to assist you in the long run. So there's my big three, Jake. I, I don't know whether that fits in with anything you wanted to hear, but they're the big ones for me. Oh, well, uh, again, you and I have been around for just a couple of years and uh, you know, I agree uh, 100%. Those are very good uh, suggestions for best practices. For our listeners, we are visiting with Mr. George Tommen, the executive director of the FHSAA, the Florida High School Athletic Association. We're going to be back in a second for some more of the interview. But first, let's hear from our podcast sponsor, Violet Defense. Violet Defense is dedicated to protecting our world from germs by bringing the power of UV disinfection to everyday spaces. Their patented technology enables them to harness the power of the sun to incorporate ultraviolet light into products and environments like never before. Whether you're ready to implement existing products 
or if you'd like to explore researching and developing a custom deployment of their technology for your school, Violet Defense has the solutions and the experience you need. Thanks again to Violet Defense for sponsoring the Educational AD Podcast. We're back with Mr. George Tommen, Executive Director of the Florida High School Athletic Association. Georgia, again, we mentioned that it's August 17th, and um, a year ago, uh, Florida, along with the rest of the United States, was facing uh, an unprecedented situation and trying to respond to COVID. And um, every athletic director that's listening to this uh, podcast had their own challenges with their school. You, as the executive director, you know, had to oversee basically over 700 schools in the state of Florida. You know, how was that? And a year later, how do you think we all did? Well, we, we're thrilled that we were able to participate last year. Let's start off by saying that we had a very good year. It was probably the most challenging year that I have been in education, uh, even including the years that I was superintendent of schools and we didn't have any money. Uh, but this last year, it, it did impact everyone. You have to understand that it's 900 miles from Monroe County, where Key West is, to Pensacola and Escambia County. And our state is incredibly diverse. And this awful pandemic hit and applied itself to our state in very, very different ways. And we have actually been about 18 months now. In March of, of, of 2020, we actually got the terrible news. We had just snuck through with our basketball tournament. And then we had all of our schools essentially shut down, public schools first, and then most of our private schools followed along. We had a quite a challenging time over the summer, even determining whether we were going to, to stop to start our, our seasons or, or not start our seasons. And what we focused on in our office was the word opportunity. Since our state is so diverse, we wanted to give our schools the opportunity to play and participate if they could, if they felt it was safe, if their county or their governing body permitted it and thought it was safe. We did not want to punish anybody for not being able to play. We removed all of our penalties for the number of games that a team must play to participate. We eliminated the number of games that a student athlete uh, must participate in in order to advance in the state finals, whatever it might be. Uh, we extended our season some uh, for our schools and for schools to go beyond the regular season time. And we were very, very fortunate to be able to have a, a fall season, a complete fall season, a complete winter season, and a complete spring season. It did look a little different. Uh, and I know our schools uh, had things looked an awful lot different for them. We thought we would be out of this by now. We thought that the vaccination situation uh, would have helped us a great deal. And I believe it has helped us. Uh, you mentioned a few minutes ago that, that we have already started school here and we're very fortunate. Last summer, the issue was, are we even going to let our schools start? And now we're beyond that point at least. And all across our state, our schools are practicing, preparing for fall sports. We have heard a few things about a few times when schools have been uh, uh, unable to practice. A few schools have shut down their football or volleyball programs. Some kids are being quarantined, and we know that they're going to, they're going to be some challenges now that our students are back in session. However, we, we believe we're on the right track. We believe in our educators. We believe in our local school districts and our local school leadership that they are doing the right things for their schools. And so we're just going to be the, in the background, again, providing opportunity for our schools. What, um, what do you think is the biggest takeaway for this school year versus, um, you know, the start of uh, this previous school year, you know, where we weren't weren't sure what was going to happen. Now we've got a, a better idea. Is there a takeaway? Is there what? Is is there a takeaway from last year to this year? Certainly, certainly there's, a, there's, there's a takeaway. And I'll use the word that's right behind you, and that's toolbox. Last year, we did not have a toolbox on how to deal with this. And now many of our schools have already come up with protocol procedures to go through. They're comfortable with it. They have a toolbox an established toolbox that they use and, and to, to address it. And it's accepted by all. 
and we understand that everyone suffers in a different way. And so, so that, that's my big takeaway that we we're prepared, better prepared. We did not think we would be here, but we are better prepared as we approach this next school year. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate that shout out too. Sure. Um, got another question for you that, um, you know, our, our normal guests, you know, don't, you know, have that, uh, I think is great opportunity to understand. Um, uh, we have in, in the state of Florida and every state has their uh, version of the red book, you know, the uh, FHSA policy manual and, and procedures. Um, there are, you know, uh, let's say there's one or two that, uh, you know, some athletic directors and coaches, you know, they really don't like that policy. Why do we have to have this? And uh, I, I dare say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I dare say that there's probably people in your office it might feel the same way. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how those policies actually take shape and how oftentimes, um, you know, there might be some professional disagreements on those? Sure. sure. Uh, first thing, let's, let's talk about a century. Let's talk about a hundred years. And uh, George Tommen and his staff didn't think up these rules a week and a half ago and publish them in a red book. These uh, policies are, and procedures have developed over uh, decades and decades and decades. And, and so we, we know they're proven in many respects, and we know that we need to adjust those because some of them might be outdated. But first and foremost, we actually follow all of our state statutes. Our legislature here in the state of Florida has gotten very active with athletic programs, and we know that. And so we are going to follow state statute. Our, our state statute determines the, the number of people on our board of directors. They determine how we, how we set things up. They determine the location and the identity of those persons. And it's pretty good. And, I, and I'm used to that. I'm not, not offended and I fully support that. The second thing that, that we follow, so primarily state, state statute. The second thing is we follow our bylaws. And the state statute sets up a procedure for us to write our bylaws. And again, this is from a historical perspective, the bylaws that existed. We have a 67 member representative assembly that meets once a year and looks at our bylaws. The bylaws, of course, follow the state statute. And then once that, that committee meets, we publish those bylaws. And then we have a board of directors that is also stipulated by the state statute comprised of 16 different members and those uh, board members write our policies. So, and we, the, if you look at it from this perspective, state statute is real broad stroke, uh, bylaw is a little uh, more narrow perspective and the policy that our board is specific. And then also here on site, we have administrative rules and keep in mind that none of those things can conflict with, with, the, with the portion above it. In other words, administrative policies have to agree with, with, uh, with, with policy, with bylaw, and with statute. And, and that's certainly how we organize things. It sounds bureaucratic. Uh, perhaps to some it might be, but it does work. Following administrative procedures, we de delve into each individual sport. And of course, we're a member, a member of the National Federation of High Schools, the publisher of rule books. And uh, we follow those rules and then give those rules out to individual coaches and athletic directors. So on the school side, you have the rules, and then you go up to the administrative procedures that our staff uh, uh, follows and writes, then the policies and the bylaws and the statute. It works for me. It, it can be complicated sometimes. I don't always agree with it uh, personally, but professionally, I'm going to support the statute and the bylaws and the policies and administrative procedures. Let's be perfectly honest. That's the way to do it. Uh, and it, and it is, it's a proven uh, situation for us here in Florida. No, I appreciate you talking about the different uh, levels. And, you know, as you know, I had the opportunity to serve both on representative assembly and um, at other levels uh, as you know, on the athletic director advisory committee. And uh, I quite frankly was always amazed at, you know, the coordination, uh, you know, between the, the various groups. So uh, again, appreciate you taking the time to uh, share that with us. Um, again, we are visiting with Mr. George Tommen, the executive director of the FHSAA. We're gonna take another quick break, uh, but we'll be back with the uh, Athletic Director's Toolbox after we hear from Sideline Interactive. 
Sideline Interactive provides indoor scoring tables and video boards that can generate over $10,000 each year while also creating more excitement in your gym. Their score tables and video boards also help make the ultimate game day experience by creating lifelong memories for your student athletes. Go to sidelineinteractive.com or call 832-786-0302 to schedule a live web demo to see their tables and boards in action. You can also email them at sales at sidelineinteractive.com. That's sales at sidelineinteractive.com to see what their fantastic products can do for you. Welcome back to our interview with Mr. George Tomman from the FHSAA here in Florida. George, this has been really cool catching up, uh, but we're not done yet. We always like to wrap up with what we call the athletic director's toolbox. Now, you shared some best practices earlier in the interview, but I was wondering if you had any other ideas or suggestions that you would want to put into a new athletic director's toolbox. What do you got for us? Well, the biggest thing I, I, I was, would like to talk about is personal relationships and the personal relationship that you build with uh, your teammate, your spouse, your supervisor, your subordinate, and whoever it might be. Um, I've always been a, 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 a promoter of being a colleague, and I think that's very important. I mentioned listening before. I mentioned finding a mentor before. I mentioned asking questions before, and I mentioned listening twice as much as you talk before. And I think those are all huge things for us. And especially now that you become an athletic director, I hope you can create an athletic team of coaches that you would listen to and work with closely. Do not be afraid to have others disagree with you. I've tried to foster a relationship with all of my subordinates, whatever role I might have had, whether it be as an assistant principal, a principal, executive director, or superintendent, and now as executive director of the FHSAA. I have a leadership team that is open. They can speak their mind. They know that the five of us will agree to do one thing at the end of a meeting. We don't throw things at each other. We don't cuss and scream and that kind of thing. But we professionally disagree. We professionally argue. And we come up with the best solution to whatever uh, problem that may might be, complicated or simple. So form that team. Do not be afraid of any idea that might come from one of those assistant coaches or assistant athletic director or secretary, whoever or whatever it might be. Listen to them and promote that concept of teamwork and you will be successful. Well, great, great advice. And, and I can speak from personal experience, uh, having been an athletic director in Florida for you know, almost this past 20 years, uh, that the staff at the FHSA office is always, you know, so helpful, uh, so willing to work with you. You know, you're absolutely right. Uh, you, you've got a great team there uh, at Gainesville and, uh, and, and you too, you know, you've always been, you know, so available as an executive director and, and so easy to work with. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you. George, I'm not trying to create more work for you, uh, but we always ask our guests this. Um, if one of our listeners wanted to reach out and uh, pick your brain, uh, is there a way that they can get in touch with you or at least get in touch with somebody on your staff? Absolutely. All you need to do is go to our website. You can punch in FHSAA and it'll lead you to our website. There's a list of contacts you can make. You can choose a topic. You can choose anything you'd like. All of our uh, athletic directors and administrators are listed there. There are quick links to that. You can reach me through the executive director link. Uh, I have three other people that are on that link. So if you don't get an answer from me, you're going to get an answer from somebody. So we welcome inquiries at any time. Again, go back to that thing. I'd always like to ask questions. And if you've got a question, please ask that question so we can provide an answer to you. All right, great stuff. Yeah, that's FHSA.com. You know, check it out. Uh, George, I know you're busy, uh, but thanks so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having me and good luck to all of our uh, current ADs, our new ADs and those veteran ADs and have a great year. Okay. For our listeners, remember the Zoom recordings of these interviews are also uploaded to the 
Educational AED Podcast YouTube channel. Thanks for listening today. Come back again next time for another episode of the Educational AED Podcast.